is a wonderful way of reminding us of the intensely personal nature of God. The Bible doesn't come to us as a textbook. It comes to us as a story. A story with a definitive beginning and a story with a definite ending. A drama comprised of seven acts. Creation, fall, promise, gospel, mission, judgment, new creation. From creation to new creation. Creation, Genesis 1 and 2. Fall, Genesis 3 through 11. Promise, Genesis 12, 1 through the rest of the Old Testament. Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mission, Acts, the epistles. All that Jesus began to do and has continued to do over the last two millennia. Judgment, new creation. And a drama made up of actual, ordinary, individual people, just like you and me, with names and places. And God is forever, through that record, focusing in the the lens to up close to those individual lives. So the cataclysmic results of the fall which are described in Genesis 3 through 11, suddenly zero in and focus on a single individual named Noah. The repopulation of the earth following the flood, the resulting table of nations, the collective efforts of all of humanity in the Tower of, the ba- in the tower of Babel and the, and the dispersion of the nations suddenly zeroes in on a single individual named Abraham from Ur, just down the road from where I was in Baghdad. Can go there. The Holocaust that preceded the Egyptian exodus suddenly focuses on two Jewish midwives named Shifra, and Pua. And by the way, nowhere in the Exodus are we ever given the name of Pharaoh, but we're given the name of those two midwives. The occupation of the promised land of the nation of Israel suddenly zeroes in and focuses on a single Canaanite woman of ill repute by the name of Rahab, who came to profound saving faith. The Dark Ages, which were the period of the judges, suddenly focus in on two Jewish migrant widows named Ruth and Naomi. The catastrophic events of the exile and all of the disruption that took place as a result of that suddenly focus on a single Jewish orphan raised by her uncle named Esther. And on it goes. So it should be no surprise that in the account of one of the most important parts of that story, the birth of God's own son, the savior of the world, that it would come wrapped in the personal experience of a handful of individuals. Isn't that fascinating? This cosmic event uh, that would, 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 would change forever the universe comes packaged in the individual personal experience of a handful of people. The shepherds, the wise men, and the three individuals whose personal stories and personal experiences are encapsulated and preserved by their personal psalms that they left us. It is the first of those psalms that we come to this morning. Mary was a young peasant girl, probably in her mid-teens. But as far as maturity level, probably equivalent today of a 30-year-old, but that's another subject and another message, right? Even so, 
She was given the incomprehensible calling and responsibility of conceiving and giving birth to the incarnate Son of God. The angel Gabriel appeared to her personally and told her that she would conceive and give birth to a son whom she was to name Jesus. And then he went on to tell her that that child would be great and would be called the Son of the Most High and that the Lord would give to him the throne of his father David, that he would reign over the descendants of Jacob forever and that his kingdom would never end. And that moreover, this would all be accomplished by the power of the Most High, who through a divine operation of the Holy Spirit would bring it to be. Sometime shortly after that announcement, that divine operation occurred. At what moment? We don't know. But she conceived. Gabriel had also informed her that her elderly cousin Elizabeth, the wife of that priest Zechariah, was with child at an old age. And so Mary quickly made her way, that journey to Judea, to the home of her cousin Elizabeth. And when Mary arrived at her house, Elizabeth, we're told, was suddenly filled with the Holy Spirit. The baby John in her womb leaped, and she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Somewhere in the course of that experience, in the midst of those two announcements, something happened to Mary beyond the conception. Something profound and profoundly personal to which she gave personal expression. It was not just the miracle that happened inside her. It was the miracle that happened to her. She gives voice to her experience and understanding of personal saving faith. Her experience in verses 46 through 49, very simple outline of the psalm, and her understanding in verses 50 through 55. All of the pronouns in the first section are in the first person, singular, personal. All of the pronouns in the second section are in the third person plural. First, her experience of personal saving faith. Notice as I read the words again how intensely personal they are. My soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. You might not have anticipated that personal of an explanation to what was happening. After all, as the words of Gabriel told her and as even Elizabeth affirmed, these were cosmic, event of cosmic proportion. But it was intensely personal for Mary. What she describes is more than just the experience of a young girl given an incomprehensible and privileged mission. This was the testimony of a soul that was personally experiencing God's saving work. It is the language of spiritual transformation. She had been deeply touched in the depths of her being, in her soul, in her spirit. 
God had become the supreme object of her life and the supreme source of her happiness. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. The Greek word magnify in most translations, glorify in the NIV, is megalos, to make great. The same root word that occurs in verse 49 when she says the mighty one has done great things for me. She was making great him who had done great things for her. So though it is intensely, this is significant, though it is intensely personal, it is intensely God-centered. Those two things are not incompatible. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She has become deeply conscious of two things. Her complete unworthiness and inability. Verse 48, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. That can be translated literally lowly. The literal word means, means afflicted state. It's an intense word. It means without status or without ability, having nothing, possessing nothing, and either resources or abilities. She's deeply aware of that. And at the same time, she is deeply aware of the greatness of God's saving work, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Those two things are juxtaposed in the poem. That is the context in which all generations will call me blessed. That's the glory and the wonder. Not her, who she is. She is nothing, but he has done great things. That is one of the key markers of genuine, personal, saving faith. An awareness of my nothingness and of his great work toward me. In the parable of the sinner and the tax collector, or the Pharisee and the tax collector, in which the Pharisee says, thank you, God, that I'm not like all of these others. And then the sinner cries out in that uh, gathering in the synagogue, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The one who thought he was something went away with nothing. The one who thought he was nothing went away with everything. Holy is his name, she says. I think it's easy for us to forget that Mary was a sinner, just like you and me, just like each and every one of us, in need of God's saving work through Christ. The Magnificat is not merely a song of amazement by a young girl bearing the Son of God. It is a testimony of sinners saved by grace It is a testimony of a sinner saved by grace through the Son of God which she bore, of which she was fully and deeply conscious. When she conceived and bore him, she was not in some unique sinless state. She was in a personal saved state. 
What made her fit to bear the Son of God was not a sinless state, but a state of grace. I can't imagine Mary bearing the Son of God and not knowing the saving work of the Son of God. Can't imagine that. When did that occur? Was it at the moment of her personal faith? As Elizabeth affirms in verse 45, blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. Was it like Abraham when he believed God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness? Was it that moment? Don't know. But there came a moment of her personal experience of saving faith. I have no doubt that she was raised in a devout home. But at some point, everyone raised in a devout home has to enter into that personal experience. So that the truth is that bearing the Son of God was nothing in comparison to being saved by the Son of God. Unique mission, absolutely unique. Privileged mission, absolutely privileged. But nothing compared to the saving work that he had done or did in her life of knowing God, my Savior. I thought of Jesus' words when the disciples returned from their first mission, rejoicing that even the demons had submitted to them in his name, in which Jesus says, it's true, but don't rejoice the demons submitted to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Far greater than whatever work he might do in us or through us, the work that he does to us. I think Mary's testimony stands as poignant witness to the absolute need of personal saving faith for each and every one of us. Nothing can take the place of that. Not even for Mary. It is one of the hallmarks of those of us who identify ourselves as evangelicals. We believe in the need for individual personal conversion. It distinguishes evangelicals from large swaths of Christendom worldwide in which Christian faith is simply a matter of being baptized and confirmed and a member of the church without ever coming to that place of individual personal saving faith. Not by the way that that infant baptism is in some way incompatible with that. Those who practice infant baptism rightly do so only on the basis of the public testimony of the faith of those parents. As a covenant of the day that that child will come to the recognition of personal saving faith. We affirm the need for personal conversion, regeneration, new birth, new creation. What Nicodemus needed. What Christ rebuked him for not understanding. That interesting? Teacher of the law, you should have known these things, Jesus says to him. The notion that prior to Christ's coming, people were not regenerate has no biblical basis. People were regenerate. And Jesus rebukes Nicodemus for not 
knowing that. It is that moment, somewhere along the way, perceptible or imperceptible, when you know that you know that you are his and that he is yours. Her words, God, my Savior. (laughs) I read not long ago the testimony of Charlie Duke, the famous Apollo astronaut who walked on the moon during the Apollo 16th mission. He attends one of our um, sister churches in New Brunsville, Texas. Raised as a good Baptist, and then confirmed as an Episcopal when he married his wife, who was a long, life, long, lifelong Episcopal. In church every Sunday of their lives, but neither personally knew Christ. Baptized, confirmed in the case of his wife, him confirmed, baptized, confirmed in the Episcopal church. In church every week. But it wasn't until their mid-40s that they came to saving faith. Both pretty disillusioned with life, disillusioned with their marriage at the time, and his wife Dottie, who was on the vestry of her local Episcopal church, attended a retreat. And for the first time realized who Christ was and yielded her life to him and asked him to come in and gloriously save her, which he did. And so for the next two years, she loved and prayed for Charlie. And then the day came that he surrendered his life to Christ. He wrote, walking on the moon was a great experience. I'd do it again. He's in his 80s. But let me tell you, it doesn't leave you with peace, he said. Money doesn't give you peace. Fame, recognition, doesn't give you peace. I had no peace in my life. But when I said, Jesus, come into my life, instantly I experienced the peace of God I had never known. And joy unspeakable. And then he wrote, you just know that you know that you know. He concluded, walking on the moon was great, but the even better walk is walking with Jesus. That's his testimony now, wherever he goes. And he said, we can all do that. I could imagine Mary saying, yeah, that was great. It was pretty phenomenal, pretty head head spinning what happened to me, but nothing compared to knowing him through his saving work for me. Which is exactly the message of Mary in the second part of her song, where suddenly everything changes to the third person plural. Her message is that what she experienced is available to all. Both that need and that opportunity exist for all. Her mission was singularly unique, but her experience of saving faith is of universal application. His mercy extends to all in the chiasm of Hebrew poetry. She begins and ends that section with that. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. What I've experienced can be experienced by anyone, anywhere, anytime, any place. And then she concludes that again in verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised his ancestors. All of us are testimony to that truth, that promise, that reality. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm, verse 51. His power has been supremely demonstrated in our salvation. And that was an allusion back to the Exodus, which until the coming of Christ was the demonstration, 
the standard of the demonstration of God's power and was only superseded by God's coming in the person of his son. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. But each of us must come exactly just like her. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has looked upon the afflicted state of his servant. That was their experience, and that's the experience of all who would come to him, the prerequisite of all that would come to him. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. We could knew what Mary knew, just as real, just as individual, just as personal, just as blessed, just as joyful, just as soul-filling and soul-fulfilling, no less than hers. So when we read her story and we hear her psalm, it isn't about us mustering up enough empathy and imagination to enter into her blessedness. That's not what it is. It's about us experiencing personally her same exact blessedness and the saving work of Christ to each of us individually, personally. Psalms are never intended to be only historical, personal expressions. It's not why they're recorded for us. They are intensely personal expressions that are handed down to us to be a resource of our expression. So that many of the prayers, several of the prayers that Jesus prayed from the cross were verbatim from Psalms. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The words of David, written of, out of deep personal experience, but became the expression of Jesus himself as he hung upon the cross. And these Psalms are intended to be our expression as well. Every bit as much as Mary's. <laughs> A gift to us. The manger serves as a sign, a pointer, an indicator of the fact that Jesus came and occupied that humble, lowly, afflicted place. Just as he has to come and desires to come and take up a boat in our humble, afflicted state and to fill that place with his glory, each of our hearts and lives and souls and spirits. Amen. Let's pray. I pray this morning that those words are your words. Her expression is your expression that your soul magnifies the Lord and that your spirit rejoices in God your Savior if that is not the case it is available the only impediment is our own sense of self-worth or accomplishment or confidence or satisfaction 
all of those things in his coming and to those, and to, those to whom he came were shown for what they were. We, like her, must come to him in that place where we recognize out of our afflicted state, he and he alone has done great things for us. And in that recognition, somehow, in some way, and at some moment, comes that moment of saving faith when we know that we know that we know that we are his and he is ours. I pray that. For you, and I pray you know that today. If that is not the case, then make it the case. Come to Him. Recognize who you are and who He is and what He's done for you, and you can know what Mary knew just as real, just as personal, just as specific. I pray that for you today. Our Father, we thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in coming to produce that in us. We thank you for bringing us to that place. We know that none of us would have come there on our own. It was only through your grace which drew us, which brought us to that point of the dissatisfaction where we knew that there was something more prepared the way proveniently preparing us so that we would come to that moment when we would yield ourselves to you. How we thank you for that. Would our souls continue to dwell and to live in the reality of that truth and of that experience, I pray today. We thank you for your table and the fellowship and communion that we enjoy at that place. We pray that you would come and meet us now. That you renew and fill our hearts to overflowing with your goodness with your grace.